Can a church ask the members of the church family to put being church as the highest priority in life? Is that okay? Is that practical? Is it biblical? If it is, how? If not, what are we doing? I sometimes worry. The kingdom of God, the church, my faith is my job. And that's not true for almost everyone in the family of God that God has called me to lead. Is it okay to ask you to put church first or the kingdom of God first? Could that really happen? Life is full of distractions. We have family, friends, partners, work, responsibilities, passions, commitments. Where should the church come in that? What does church even mean anyway? Do we mean Sunday morning? Do we mean Sunday morning and Wednesday night? Do we mean prayer meetings, serving on teams, going to events? Do we actually give our money and time to a church in order to receive spiritual inspiration and direction, just like we pay Cineworld or Netflix or our phone provider or our news provider to receive information and inspiration? What should the church family and leaders expect of church members, of each other? What should the church family members expect of the church and its leaders? And anyway, why are we talking about church all the time? It's about Jesus, the kingdom, not some man-made structure. I'm not going to answer all of these questions today. I do plan to in the coming year. I plan to bring clarity to all those areas. We plan to do that as a team. But right now, to begin, we need a vision. We need to know what it is that God has called us to do, to be. What it means to be church in a way that makes Jesus Lord life work and the kingdom come. I believe that the local church is the answer to the world's problems, person by person, time after time. So what is the vision? Let me share what I believe is God's vision, his dream for us and our shared future. Then we can get back to some of those church questions. This is 2 Kings 4 verses 1 to 7. The wife of a man from the group of the prophets cried out to Elisha. She said, My husband is dead. You know how much respect he had for the Lord. But he owed money to someone. And now that person is coming to take my two boys away. They will become his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? I don't have anything there at all, she said. All I have is a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around to all your neighbours. Ask them for empty jars. Get as many as you can. Then go inside your house. Shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all of the jars. As each jar is filled, put it over to one side. The woman left him. Then she shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she spoke to one of her sons. She said, bring me another jar. But he replied, there aren't any more left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God about it. And he said, go and sell the oil, pay what you owe. You and your sons can live on what is left. Six months before we moved to Coventry, we were given these verses. I've been sat with them for the best part of five years. There are many, many things to say here, but the key thing was the question that I felt God asked me in the first instance. What if? What if they'd had access to a vat? 
What if they'd poured the oil down the village well? What if they'd poured it in a lake? What if they'd stopped up the windows and doors of their house and poured it in the roof? I'm not trying to belittle the woman and her sons. God was asking me this question for a reason. I needed to see something. The limit on the oil is not the jar from which it is being poured. The limit to the oil is the receptacle into which it is being poured. The limit isn't the oil or the jar. The limit is the number of jars that they got from their neighbours. How do you grow a church? Accepted wisdom is you fill it on Sunday with people and then you put, when that's full, you put on a second service or a third service and then you buy or build a bigger building and repeat. This is not God's vision for us. His vision is one of overflow, of multiplication, of everything being ready to overflow and for overflow. Of building without the constraints of buildings, without the constraints of structures. He wants us to build a structure that can grow with the oil, where the oil of his spirit can flow as he wills, unencumbered. In four years as leader of this church, we've, had, we've added more admin staff than any other type. Why? Because there is work created by family. We all have life admin. We choose to spend money as a church so that a few people can do finance and organisation so the rest of the family doesn't have to. If the family's life admin grows, because the family grows, we will be able to afford to staff that. If the church was run purely on how good the staff were up here and your one job was to bring people to be wowed by us and Jesus, however successful that was, we would be limited. Limited by the building size. Limited by the skill level of the team, the band, the welcomers. Limited by whether your friends and family would actually come through that door. Now don't get me wrong, I want you to invite your friends and family and get them saved on a Sunday morning. Yes, please, God. But everything needs to be able to multiply, to overflow. Simple services that can be redone in any building, not West End standard pyrotechnics. We do our best, but everything we do remains scalable, multipliable, simple, ready for overflow. That's why, though we love Sunday morning with every fibre of our being, it's not just about Sunday. It's about us, it's about our homes, our communities, our prayers. Let's go back to the widow and her sons. They did the miracle. The man of God, he just gave some instructions. She held the pouring jar. The young boys got the containers. They went into a room and they locked the door behind them. This single parent family worked together and saw a miracle. They listened to God through his messenger and boom. They probably looked ridiculous to their friends borrowing jars, but they had faith. They listened and they did. And then God did the work. Jesus asked us to shut the door and go and pray in the Sermon on the Mount. When he brings back the little girl from the dead, he kicks everyone out, he shuts the door and he wakes her up. The call is to prayer, is to shutting the door on outside influence and being radically transformed to overflow by being transformed by our closed door relationship with Jesus alone and in our families and friendships. We will give you, as this year goes on, activated teaching through twos and threes and beyond in how to live that way. Who was this Elisha guy that gave the message? He was the successor to Elijah. Elijah went first and did amazing things. He's like the top prophet in the Old Testament. 
But he went alone and he struggled with depression. And in the midst of that depression, he cried out to God. And one of the things that God did for him was to give him Elisha. And when Elisha succeeded him and started to do what Elijah had done, he built a community of prophets. This woman is part of that community. This is miraculous community life. There is entrepreneurism, community, family and God at work. There is really real need, real issues and real answers. The miracle doesn't happen at church done by a priest or a prophet. The woman and her her sons need their friends and their community to supply the jars. This is a community story. We want to live in communities. Church groups, small groups or whatever we call them are so often weekly meetings. And whilst there may be shared friendship and support, it's not deep and it's not open and it's not the primary relationship that we have. The vision God has for us is community where we know each other's needs, where we serve each other and share life in the fullness, the rawness and the beauty that is there. This can't happen on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. It must be deep and wider. We're called to build families on mission, communities of mission. I have been so blessed by living this way. My children have been loved, discipled, and yes, babysat, that's good, by people whom I've loved, discipled, and not exactly babysat, but I've cleared up after them a few times, physically and metaphorically. When we open our homes to friends and contacts, mixing those who know Jesus and those who don't know Jesus, all of life gets richer. There's less quibbling over church issues and more love and more power. Holy Spirit, life like Jesus, God's parenting love start getting splashed around in all of our lives, in every area of our lives. And before we know it, our desire to transform and meet the needs fills the jars of our neighbours. We're transformed and our life with Jesus is ignited. It's hard work, but it's the best kind of hard work. It's that work that is fulfilling life in all its fullness. In this passage, a destitute widow and her two boys, at risk of being trafficked, are saved. A town sees God come close and save them. Faith is built, lives are changed, and all of those jar owners would know the story. When am I getting my jar back? This is a story of justice, of business, of transformation. It's a story of obedience and love, of listening and doing. All the woman and her sons have is faith. All Elisha has is a word from God. And between them, they have a small jar of oil. We have a vision to build a church on a word from God and a big, fat, faith-filled yes of obedience. To build a church that is all of us positioning ourselves to receive God's overflow and allow it to flow out through our passionate, disciplined devotion to him. The openness of our homes and lives to one another and those whose jars are empty. To build a church where everyone gets to play, everyone gets to pray, everyone gets to see lives changed and every one of us overflows with the Spirit and changes our area person by person. So what? We will be back. Over 2019 and 2020, we'll have vision statements, mission statements, clarity, websites, logos, explanations, structures. 
But it actually comes down to one question. I gave you loads of questions at the start and I haven't answered them all. But my question to you is, what will you put first? We can put Jesus as Lord and take the exhilarating and sometimes hard road of expecting and seeing overflow, miraculous community, disciplined prayer and mission, always submitting every part of our life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Or we can allow the things of this world, the cares of this life, society's undermining lies to distract us. Jesus, the kingdom, the church, community can all happen as an extra, an add-on, just a bit of some of the stuff we do. That's the choice. What comes first? We get today to rededicate ourselves to God's vision for us as a church. There is more to say, there is detail to add, but as we commit ourselves to overflow, to multiplication, we get to rededicate ourselves to God's vision for us. There is more to say, more detail to add, but as we commit ourselves to overflow, to multiplication, we rededicate ourselves. We are also renaming our church. Burton Green, St John's Westwood and St Stephen's Canley will remain. But together, the family will be named the Bridge Church. The Bridge overarching the overflow of the Spirit, the bridge as the small jug of oil being the conduit from heaven to earth. Each of us can be that bridge in somebody's life. Each community is a bridge out into the community. Each base is a bridge between heaven and earth and together we get to stand together and be united together in the arches of the bridge, connected, flowing in the spirit, one family with one vision.